Good morning. Uh, thank you for the, the warm welcome. Um, I'm Isaac Brodsky. I'm a software engineer at uh, Uber, and I'd like to talk to you today about some of the great work we've been doing on open source uh, geospatial uh, analytics tools, um, especially the H3 and Kepler GL projects. Um, we've been using these uh, quite a lot at, at Uber, and um, I'm excited to tell you a little bit about why we're excited for these, uh, for these tools. And uh, sorry, one uh, more technical difficulty. Just give me a moment. Sorry. Yes. Oh. Sorry about that. So today I'd like to talk about. Um, H3 and discrete global grid systems, and a little bit about how we're uh, integrating that with Kepler GL so we have a complete open source uh, geospatial analytics uh, toolkit. I want to start with uh, discrete global grid systems, which H3 is one, and a little bit about why we have um, these systems. As we know, the real world is very messy. If we look at like a satellite image of what's happening in the real world, um, there's all sorts of complexities to this. There's shadows, there's cars driving around, there's streets, there's buildings, there's all these different features. And working with this data, as I'm sure we all know, is very, very messy. What we usually do to try to uh, deal with this messiness and to make it something that we can do, computation, uh, analytics, science, and so on, is to start extracting features, uh, zones, road networks, things like this out of the data. And we get something that looks like the, the map in the middle where we start having points of interest and we start having a, a lot of interesting data about what's going on in the, in the world. But there's still uh, limitations to working with the data in this form. If I want to ask questions like, uh, what's the nearest Starbucks? Where's the nearest uh, car that can pick me up and give me a ride? Where's um, uh, just how do I get from one place to another, I start to have to ask or difficult questions like what street am I on? How are these streets connected to other streets? Uh, and things like this. And this is a computationally very difficult problem to, uh, to deal with. Overlaying grids on top of the world, though, gives us a great tool set to start addressing these questions. Now if I want to ask questions like where's the nearest uh, Starbucks or where's the nearest uh, Uber driver that can pick me up. It's simply a matter of looking at the grid and looking at some surrounding cells. And this becomes computationally much more efficient and much more understandable problem. And so discrete global grid systems are discrete. They break the world up into individual cells and every place is in a cell. They're global, so they encompass the entire world. And they're systems of grids, so we have grids that relate to each other that can be finer and coarser than one another that also allow us to do a lot of interesting analysis uh, that way. H3 is a specific implementation of a discrete global grid system. Um, it's one of a, a number that are out there available, um, but we think that it has some specific advantages, and that's why we chose to develop it at Uber. One of the main questions that we get is why do we use a hexagonal grid system? And so I'd like to dive into a little bit about some of the technical choices that we made with H3 and um, uh, what drove those decisions. I think one of the, the key questions that we ask when developing a grid system is what do we want the grid cell shape to be? And we have really three uh, good options, squares, triangles, and hexagons, because these are the ones that can tile a plane. Squares, I think, are a pretty, um, pretty straightforward choice to make. Um, in general, we can draw them a lot easier. Uh, when we start working with images and computers, this is one of the first things that I think people start to learn uh, to deal with is square images and raster images. But there's a bit of a drawback to squares, which is they have this concept of two different types of neighbors. If you look at one of the internal squares on this slide, you can see that some of the uh, neighbors, four of the neighbors of a cell share an edge, but four of them only share a vertex or a point with that cell. This complicates our ability to do this kind of uh, vicinity analysis, convolution analysis. Uh, it, it complicates it greatly. Triangles, if anything, have a, a much harder time with this. They have even more different types of neighbors. And then you also have this uh, inversion of orientation, which also makes things very difficult to work with. 
Hexagons, though, have some unique advantages here in that they have a single type of neighbor. Uh, they have neighbors that they share an edge with, and that's it. And this allows us to simplify our analysis quite a bit. Um, and so this necessity of doing analysis on things that are close to other things is really one of the main things that drove our adoption uh, at Uber of H3 and of discrete global grid systems. As you can imagine, we often need to do uh, optimization over marketplaces where we need to know what supply and what level of demand are close to each other. And hexagons are a great tool for, uh, uh, for doing this analysis. We also need to make a number of other choices that I alluded to earlier in developing grid systems. One of them is the projection system that we used. Um, I'll briefly uh, describe that. Uh, we treat the world as a 20-sided solid, an icosahedron, and we use a gnomonic projection onto that icosahedron, and then we build the base layer of the grid on top of each of those icosahedron faces. And then from that base layer of the grid, we further subdivide it uh, out to res from resolution zero all the way to resolution 15, which is about one square meter uh, grid cell sizes. As you can see here, though, we come to the bit of a drawback of using hexagons, which is that they do not subdivide perfectly. Unlike squares, where we can subdivide them perfectly into four uh, or nine cells, something like this, that are exactly contained by the coarser cell, when we do this for hexagons, we do introduce this kind of air around the edges. This looks uh, fairly scary at first, um, but it turns out that it's possible to work with this uh, pretty easily. For a lot of operations that we do in H3, we actually don't need to worry about this error, especially if we're working at a single resolution. And for other use cases where we do need to move between resolutions and we do start to run into this error, there's often ways that we can either uh, deal with it or that it is um, uh, kind of tractable as part of the uh, as part of the analysis. All in all, this allows us to build a fully uh, global, discrete global grid system. And as you can see here, we show the icosahedron faces on the globe, along with the resolution zero uh, cells of the H3 grid. You can see that there's a one other edge case that I haven't mentioned yet, which is that we can't have all hexagons in our grid system. We also have to have a few pentagons. Um, specifically, we need to have 12 pentagons at every resolution. We like hexagons, though, so we really don't want to have to deal with the pentagons. So we decided to place those all at the icosahedron vertices and place all the icosahedron vertices in water. So at every resolution, that pentagon cell is in the water. And at Uber, obviously, we're doing a lot with uh, use cases on land, and so this allows us to uh, not deal with the pentagons very much. Unfortunately, I just saw a couple of days ago, I think, uh, some news about us launching a water taxi service, which I believe was in um, Nigeria. So we do have to deal with the water a little bit. Luckily, uh, we still have some tools for dealing with this in H3. Um, H3 still works with pentagons very well. Um, they're really just hexagons with missing a side. <laughs> so moving on from the uh, H3 grid, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, the Kepler GL project, which is another open source project from Uber. Oh, maybe the receiver's here. So Kepler GL is a spatial analytics uh, application. You can run it in your browser just by going to kepler.gl and start working with data sets in the browser. Um, and it's a, a great tool for doing this kind of analysis. It allows you to get very easily started on working with data, visualizing data, exploring data. Uh, it can work with a, a, large different for, a large number of formats of data as well. Again, all in the browser, or if you're a developer, you might want to embed it as part of your application. And it's uh, very exciting to see H3 also available in Kepler.gl. So here, what I did was I took some of the example data that we have for Kepler GL, some of the San Francisco trees data set, which you can see on the right. 
I'm able to very easily visualize that in Kepler and start exploring the data, but I'm also very able, easily able to give Kepler a, a hexagonified data set, an H3 data set, where I'm able to look at the density of trees in San Francisco rather than the individual location of all the trees. And this allows me to have a tool that very easily work with H3 data sets, visualize H3 data sets, uh, again, all using an open source uh, application uh, toolkit. So as I mentioned, this is all open source technology. Uh, you can find it on our GitHub, uh, on the Uber engineering blog for Kepler GL, of course, at Kepler.gl. Um, so I'm looking forward to see what uh, everybody makes of it, and I'm sure I'm going to see a lot of uh, really fantastic maps coming out of it. Thank you.